Today we're going to be talking about UX, or user experience, research. Let's start by understanding what we mean by user experience. According to the International Organization for Standardization, it's a person's perceptions and responses that result from the use or anticipated use of a product, system, or service. However, Nielsen Norman Group, an industry standard usability and user experience firm, defines it as UX encompasses all aspects of the end user's interaction with the company, its services, and its products. And finally, the User Experience Professionals Organization defines it as every aspect of the user's interaction with a product, service, or company that make up the user's perceptions of the whole. UX design is concerned with all the elements that together make up that interface, including layout, visual design, text, brand, sound, and interaction. UX works to coordinate these elements to allow for the best possible interaction by users. Peter Morville has put together this useful honeycomb of UX that is made up of six criteria, such as useful, that the content should be original and fulfill a need, desirable, that the image, identity, brand, and design elements evoke emotion and appreciation, accessible, that the content needs to be accessible to people with disabilities, that the content is credible, Users must trust and believe what you tell them, that information is findable, content needs to be navigable and locatable on-site and off-site, and usable. The site must be easy to use to complete the necessary. Let's take a second to focus on the last criteria. So what is usability? According to the usability site for Germany, it's the extent to which a product, system, or service can be used by specific users to achieve specific goals, with effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction in a specific context of use. But essentially, it's whether or not a user is able to use something to complete an intended task, not necessarily whether or not they enjoy using it, but of course that should always be the end. So true or false, UX equals usability. The answer is false, because as we just discussed a moment ago, usability is only one factor of a user's entire experience with a site or application. However, typically, all good UX involves good usability. All right, let's bring it back to today's topic. What is UX research? Broadly, it's investigating the habits, tasks, wants, demographics, history, and more of the users of a product to better understand their needs and expectations when interacting with said product. As a UX researcher, while not usually being directly embedded into the product team, you would help provide insights about the user's wants and needs so that the teams can make decisions about what product to build, what issues to fix, and more. As a UX researcher, what you investigate and the methods you use will vary depending on different factors, such as the product you're analyzing. You would seek to understand different things about adults using a touchscreen dashboard in their car versus children playing a math game. What you want to learn would also determine your study. What part of the development process the team is in would also have an impact. For example, if the team hasn't started building anything, they may want insights as to what customers want. If the team is nearing the end of the release, they may just want to know what quick fixes they can make before going live. And if you have any existing research about these users, you can either use it or see if it needs to be updated. If you become a UX researcher, expect to perform the following tasks regularly. Figuring out what problem or question the team is trying to solve or answer. Picking the best method or methods for solving them. Soliciting and recruiting participants, and this may again require incentivizing them. And then of course there's conducting the actual research with participants. We won't go into specifics here, but you'll need to know a lot of different types of methods. If you have questions on this, feel free to ask your instructor. Communicating findings, like in the example of a usability report, to product, design, marketing, and more. Traveling to the users, bringing users to colleagues, or meeting them remotely, and just like any other job, keeping up with latest industry trends. And expect to face certain challenges as a UX researcher, such as getting skeptics to believe your findings and having to be persuasive, managing meetings with lots of users and colleagues, staying up to date with new tools, technology, and other research that's being presented in the industry, proving the value and or cost financially of your findings, creating polished professional looking reports and presentations, giving presentations to various audiences, dealing with different time zones, especially in global or enterprise companies, 
presenting data in a me visual and meaningful way, knowing which method to use and when, as well as running multiple studies at one time. I already mentioned that usability and user researchers have to present findings to teams. This slide represents a typical presentation where a user researcher might be presenting usability findings to a product team. Often, researchers will take a screenshot of whatever they collected feedback on and use annotations to convey the top insights to the team. As I mentioned earlier, we'll look at a couple of examples of how to avoid biases in user research. This section is just meant to demonstrate some of the knowledge and skills you would need to become a user researcher. If these next slides are interesting to you, consider finding out more about this. Using random control to avoid the order bias. So order bias means that we want to account for the fact that some people will likely pick the answers closest to the top, either out of ease or perhaps because they are quickly scanning. By changing the order of these options available within each instance of a survey, we can help ensure that, in this example shown on the screen, purple and green aren't picked more times than the other colors simply because they're at the top of the list. Additionally, something called acquiescence bias, which is the desire in people to please or agree with others, can also magnify the effects of order bias when the positive options are fixed at the top. Avoid leading questions. Here's an example of a leading question. How short was Napoleon? This answer is leading because it implies that Napoleon was short and does not give the user or the participant the option to say whether or not they actually agree with that statement. A better example of this question might be, how would you describe Napoleon's height? Avoiding loaded questions. Loaded questions are similar to leading questions, but they're slightly different. Let's take a look. So a loaded question is, where do you enjoy drinking your coffee? A better example of this question might be, do you enjoy drinking coffee? And if yes, where? In the first question, we assume that the user or the participant enjoys drinking coffee. and We don't give them an option to opt out of saying that they do enjoy drinking coffee and only providing supplemental details if they do actually enjoy drinking coffee. Avoiding double-barreled questions. Let's look at an example of one. I feel welcomed by the staff and other youth at the center. True or false? The reason that this is double-barreled is that Although we're asking them to provide a singular answer of true or false, we're actually giving them the multiple criteria to assess, whether or not the staff makes them feel welcomed and the other youth makes them feel welcomed. It could be that their answer to both of these questions is either true or false, but there are going to be some participants where they only think one of those is true and that the other one is false. Here's a better example of how to display this question. It would actually be better to split it up into two separate statements. I feel welcomed by the staff at the center, and then secondly, I feel welcomed by the youth at the center. Avoiding jargon. So jargon is technical terms or industry lingo. So if you're doing, for example, a usability test, you wouldn't want to say something like, do you like the color palette of the global navigation? Because terms like color palette and global, global navigation are only things that someone would care about and maybe actually know about if they are in the industry of creating websites or applications um, and they're somehow involved in the creation and the, the design of those things. It might be better to actually just say, tell me what you like or don't like about what's available on the screen. And if the user isn't giving you specific enough answers from there, you can continue to, to drill down deeper and get more specific. But you want to avoid using terms that are not just part of common knowledge.